Hey, go ahead and take out your copy of God's Word, Genesis chapter 17. We are continuing our Generations series. I hope this has been good. Has it been rich? This feels like a, like a rich series. I want to preach all the land. I want to preach all the land. When Camden and I moved into our house Four and a half years ago, we closed at 8.30. We had crowbars going on the tile floor by 10.30. I mean, it was on. We were pulling down, pulling up. I was yanking out. I mean, don't get me wrong. That was the extent of what I could contribute. I knew that I was not going to be much help on the building process, but I could tear something out. I could throw stuff in the dumpster. And we got in like in like weeks we remodeled, we gutted the place, and we remodeled about 95% of the house, and then I'm telling you, we stopped. Hard stop. Not a pause, we stopped. The project wasn't done, but I was done. How many of you have ever been, my finances were done, I, w- I was done. Have you, ever, have you ever been that way? I need you to raise your hand if you have a current project at your house that is unfinished. I need you to raise your hand. Yes, some spouses, you're pointing at your husband. I get that. That is never going to be finished. That is an ongoing project until Jesus comes back. But here's what I want you to know. It's no shame Sunday, y'all. It's no shame Sunday. The cracks in the, in the sidewalk, no shame. Half your walls painted, no shame. You have come into a house where there is no shame for unfinished projects. The thing that reminds me of this is, is a glaring reminder. Um, is in our, in our bedroom, we have a ceiling fan that was manufactured in 1981. And I know, I know like mid-century modern, like that retro is in style. 1981, it isn't in style. Like it's, it's bad. There's only one light that works on it. That's probably just because we need to replace the bulbs. But it's like, it's that, it's that level of neglect, y'all. It's that level, it's that level. And, and what I want to ask you, I'm not mad about your unfinished bathroom, but here's what I want to ask you. What's your 1980s ceiling fan in your life? What's, what's the thing spiritually or in your family or in your, in your career, in your ministry? What's that thing that 18 months ago you said, God, I'm going to get around to that? We need, to, we need to fix that. We need to, we need to upgrade that. I want to I wanna preach you into, into all the land. Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, I want to remind you that Abram received the promise at 75. He birthed Ishmael at 86. So this is 24 years later, almost a quarter of a century later. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm El Shaddai. God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down to the ground, and then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I'm changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant and I will give you all the land. Say all the land. And I will give you all the land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be there, God. Can I give you three crucial questions that I think that we will need to ask ourselves and that will help move us on into all the land? The first question is this What does it mean for you? What does it mean for you personally? See, this started with Abraham, this starts with you. It doesn't end with you, but it starts with you. I need to get you to believe for your blessing. 
If Abram wouldn't have received the blessing, then he couldn't have passed it, passed it on to Isaac. And Isaac couldn't have passed it on to Jacob. And Jacob put, couldn't have passed it on to his 12 sons. See, there are some mindsets that we can develop as believers, whether you've been saved for six minutes or 60 years. These are some mindsets that we can develop as believers that can actually keep us from occupying all the land. The first is what I call the false humility mindset the false humility mindset what if Abraham would have said something like this what if, what if Abraham wouldn't have said oh God doesn't want want to bless me I, I just need to stay poor and mediocre so I will stay humble listen here's what I need you to believe today that God doesn't want to bless around you he wants to bless through you if God, if you don't, let me say it this way. If you don't have it, you can't give it. I, I don't know about you, but when I'm traveling, I love, I love a bypass. I love a bypass. Y'all with me? Um, if the NCDOT would call me and ask my opinion, I could, I could fix everything. There should have been a bypass on Highway 74 from here to the mountains around Shelby 25 years ago. Can you say amen? I love a, I love a bypass when I'm traveling, but not in my life. And here's what happens is that sometimes spiritually, we think that God operates on a bypass. God, I want you to, I want you to bless my family, but I'm not worthy to receive it. God, I, I want you to bless my community, but I don't want you to throw, fi- I don't know if that I'm worthy to receive the financial blessing. God, I want you to bless our community, and I want you to eradicate poverty, and I want you to eradicate generational curses. And God says, I want that too, and I want it to go through you God doesn't want to get it around you it doesn't start it doesn't it, it starts with you but it doesn't stop with you your false let me just say it bluntly your false humility is limiting how God can bless other people God wants to bless. I need you to get to you to believe for your blessing. It's not selfish. Selfish is when it stops with you, but but you are blessed to be a blessing. The second mindset that can keep us from stepping into all the promises is what I call the unqualified mindset. The unqualified mindset. What if Abraham would have thought, I'm not good enough? I've done something that disqualifies me from being used by God. God. God used somebody else. I think, it's, I think it's noteworthy that God starts out by reminding Abraham that all of the promises are still good. God says, I'm, what's God start out with? Who, what's he, who, who he is, who he is. See, that's your problem. You're not starting with who God is. You're starting with who you are. And if you start with who you are, then you'll come up with 99 reasons why you're not worthy to receive the blessing that God has declared over your life. But it doesn't start with you. It starts with who he is. you got to start with who he is. And God's reminding somebody today that he's El Shaddai. And, and you're trying to inter- stop interrupting God. Stop saying, well, well, I know you're at, no, no, no. He says, I'm El Shaddai. And this is a covenant promise. God can't go back on his promise because he already made a covenant. And if he goes back on his covenant, then he has to nullify the work that Jesus did on the cross. And he's not going to do that. And I know you're hesitating. And I know there's all of these reasons that you have in your head, what you did last night, what you did 12 years ago, why you're not worthy to receive the promises of God. But God says, I'm El Shaddai. And this is covenant stuff and it doesn't matter what you've done if you come to me and ask for forgiveness and ask for my grace my covenant promises are still good in your life can I remind you that Abram this is after say after this is after Abram had lied about who Sarah was this is this is 13 years after Ishmael right we talked about Ishmael last week Sometimes we birth Ishmael's in our lives that leave Ishmael memories. And sometimes we birth Ishmael's in our life that there are physical representations of the thing in your life that is the, that is the representation of your disobedience to God. And God says, I'm bigger than that. God says, my covenant promises are more than that. God wants to 
bless you. It starts with you. The second thing is what does taking all the land mean for your, for your family? Have you noticed through these five weeks, Genesis 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and now 17, have you noticed how many times, I haven't counted them, this would, might be interesting to go back and just count them, how many times does God say descendants? How many times does he say generations? It's almost like passing on generational blessing is really key to the covenant promises of God. And it's almost like if we would ever stop passing on generational blessing, then God might bypass. I believe with all of my heart that one of the many reasons that this church has been blessed for 64 years as it was founded on, first it was founded on prayer and fasting, but it was also founded as a church for all generations. On this property, we have a daycare and we have a living center. You could be born here and die here and never leave here. And I don't know that that's necessarily what we're preaching. I need you to go out into the marketplace and win a few people. But this is, it's a picture, it's a representation, right, of all generations generations, Abraham had to realize that he carried the seed of generational promise within him, and you have to realize that you carry the seed of generational promise within you. 16-year-old, you say, I don't have any kids, but you carry the seed of generational promise within you, and so that's why the decisions that you make to stay pure, that's the, why the decisions that you make not to visit those sites on the web, that's the, on, the, on the computer, that's why it matters now, because that seed of generational promise is already it's already germinating. That's why single young adult in your re re relationship, even though you're not married yet, the decisions that you're making are carrying the seed of generational promise. Single adult who is called to singlehood, you carry the seed of generational promises through spiritual children, through nieces, through nephews. All of us carry the promises of God. That's why it's important as a church that we can watch a video like that about conference and shrug our shoulders and say, I have no interest in being there whatsoever. Some of you didn't even understand that video. Come on, raise your hand a little bit. You're like, I didn't understand the music. What were they wearing and what were they doing? And that's how we know we're doing it right as a church. Because you know what we can do? We can show up and serve. We can give. We can pray and we can dedicate ourselves that we will always be a church that reaches all the generations. I was reminded of this again last night as I was making a fire. Um, by the way, can we just take a moment and bind the spirit of North Dakota that, is, that has made its way? <laughs> I have out-of-town guests from California. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you woke up and it was 24 degrees. I don't know what to say, but we're going to pray in sunshine. We're going to pray in warm temperatures. We're going to believe for that. But as I was building, as I was building that fire and as it started to die down and I wanted to get that fire going again, you know what the first thing that I did? The first thing that I did was I took those coals. I took those coals. I started so 55 plus, we need you like never before. We need you to stay hot for Jesus. We need you to stay alive for Jesus. Fuel, we need you. Fuel 30-somethings, 30, 30 40-something 40 up until about 54. I need you and I continue to call you into your role as leaders and influencers in this church and in the, into the community. You are about to step into another level in your leadership and in your influence. And then we always need new wood, whether that's the next generation spiritually or the next generation physically can you say amen? amen here's the here's the third thought third question what does what does taking all the land mean for our church for our city and for the nations what does it mean for our church for our city and for the nations. In verse two, countless descendants, again, not just children, but spiritual children. Verse six, multitude of nations. Verse eight, all the land. I believe that God wants to reach our city and the nations through our church multiply church. I believe that that's, a, that that's a blessing. It's not just a name. It's a, it's a blessing. 
I, I've been telling the staff 10 years. I don't know why I've been picking 10 years. How, you know, maybe more, maybe less. It's in God's timing. But I just am passionate about spending and giving the next 10 years of my life to multiplying churches and multiplying disciples. Here's what we're going to do at Multiply Church. We're going to plant churches that plant churches, and we're going to make disciples that make disciples. Let's just keep it simple, right? Like, let's just do the Bible stuff. You say, how, how are you going to do that? Through the gospel, through the word, and through the gospel. Our words are life, family, freedom, purpose. It just means Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus fills, Jesus calls. We're not going to follow spiritual fads. We're, not gonna, we're certainly not going to follow. I can promise you this. We're not going to follow culture, and we are not going to follow spiritual fads here at Multiply Church. We're going to follow the gospel, and we're going to pre preach Jesus saves, and he heals, and he fills, and he calls. And Jesus saves, and he heals, and he fills, and he calls. There are people walking around that are not awake, people going through motions, but they're not alive, and they need the breath of life through Jesus Christ. And then they need to worship, not just shoulder to shoulder, but face to face. We all need to find our tribe, find something you love with, and do it with people you love. I love I'm with my tribe about every Saturday morning, two, three, three Saturdays ago, in the snow. 20, 20 some degrees. We were, we were out there. I don't know if God was there, but we were there and, and we were, we were, we had our tribe and then, and then we will continue to lead people into freedom away from life controlling issues and into the freedom through the power of the baptism of the Acts 1, 8 and Acts 2, 4 in filling of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. Cause I want it all. If it's in the Bible, we want it today. And then leading people into their purpose that we believe that everybody has a divine design and is to be used in ministry. How do we do that? We become multipliers. Remember our multiplier series through identity and gifting and generosity and soul winning and team. And we're saying that our identity is formed through the word of God. It's not formed by what others say about me. My identity is formed not by what I say about myself, but my identity is formed by the word of God. My gifting, we all have Ephesians 4, apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, shepherding, teaching, gifting. And we're gonna use that in the the house and in the marketplace, that, that we are going to be a house of generosity and that we will live lives of, of, of uh, contagious generosity and then soul winning, soul winning. I've, I'm a little behind on this. Forgive, my, forgive me for being a little bit behind on my biology, but I'm realizing that hospitals don't make babies. Did, did you know that? John, Oh, do we need to have a class? Um, <laughs> they're born in hospitals sometimes, but, but it's like people that, you, you see this? Hospitals don't make babies, people make babies. I'm, I'm realizing that churches don't make disciples, people make disciples. And not until everyone in the church takes personal ownership and responsibility for making disciples, the church will never be what God has called it to be. We want to plant churches that plant churches. We want to make disciples who make disciples. And then we're a team. We're in this together. We're in heart and soul. Heart and soul. Let, let me give you a couple of, of specifics. Just cast a little vision if that's all, all right. I know... I know you still haven't taken some of your Christmas decorations down, but Easter's almost here. So, so uh, get your Easter decorations ready. Um, this is, here's some thoughts. You know, I started thinking, we started thinking as a team, the first resurrection didn't take place in the tabernacle. Where did it take place? In the, in the streets, right? Do you know the last resurrection is not just going to take place in, in churches? Where is it going to take place? In the streets, and so our job in the meantime is to take this resurrection gospel where? To the, to the streets. What if we took Easter to the streets this year? What if we took it to the streets? What if on Saturday, see our churches, but we've been ministering to these communities for, for decades, our Dream Center ministers to them. What, but what if we took the Dream Center to the streets on Saturday? What if we knocked on doors with food and invitations? And then what if on Resurrection Sunday, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been to the tree lighting celebration on Union Street where they block off Union Street and just have a party. And I think we should party at Christmas. I think we should party at Easter like nobody's business. 
Christmas because we are celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Get a little pre-party for Easter. But what if we took Easter? What if we threw the biggest resurrection party that our county and our community has ever seen? What if we jam-packed Union Street and it was a place where we could invite all of friends and neighbors and take Easter to the streets because we want to take all the land? I know this is like a horribly kept secret, but I just want to keep tossing this out to you guys. You know, this, this village shopping center. So, so if you've just started coming, some of you are, are brand new to Multiply Church. The Village Shopping Center, which is across the street, that was the original land that our founding pastor asked Mr. Cannon for several decades ago. He was told, oh, I'm sorry, it was reserved for a shopping center. And so Mr. Cannon gave Pastor Tom this property. We are so grateful for it. We are blessed because of it. But in 2000, remember, uh, remember all the play. How many of you have been around here for like, it lived in Cabarrus County over 20 years? Y'all remember when Hallmark was over? Not many of you, like a fourth of the crowd. That's a, that's a cool picture. You know, I tell people that my wife and I are a picture of Cabarrus County. She's the local Southern girl, and I'm the Yankee transplant. And that's our county, and that's our church, right? And so we got, look, if we can do this, if Southerners and Yankees can mix, we can do, we can do this. But uh, you guys remember when Hallmark was over there? Honey baked ham? What was, the, what was the Chinese restaurant that everybody, like altar calls would be cut short because people would rush over to the Chinese restaurant sometimes. And, and Walmart was there and Winn-Dixie. I don't know if Winn-Dixie is even a thing. That's a shopping, that's a grocery store, Chris. We had a win- what about, y'all didn't have these in South Dakota. Y'all didn't have no Piggly Wiggly. You didn't have Piggly Wiggly. Yeah, yeah, we got some grocery stores. But, uh, but, but we start, we, the Lord opened up. It was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle. I'll go into the whole story at some point. But just, just know that over the last two decades, we've started to move the prayer place and children's ministry and the youth ministry and the church offices and Sweet 15 and Espanol and the Dream Center, Center and Southeastern University. But there is still some unclaimed territory over there. And I think there's some territory that we still need to step into. All the land. Say all the land. All the, all the land. What does God, God wants to bless through you, church. He wants to reach this community with the love and the power of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't want to bypass you. He wants to take it straight through you. He wants to give you all the land. Say all the land. Let's come full circle. Let me ask you one more time. What about what about you? What about you? What is your 1980s ceiling fan? What's the thing that God wants to upgrade in your life? What's the land that He wants to give you? Said, Lord, would you would you show me a a clue in the scripture how we can how we can do this in our personal lives? And he showed me verse 8. So verse 8 says this, and I will, gi- I will give you all the land of Canaan. That's future tense, right? Where you now live, that's present. So you have a future promise, a present situation. Now watch this. Here's, here's where I think the key is. Where you now live as a foreigner. A foreigner is how you feel. So you have a future promise, a present situation, and you're feeling about the inadequacy of your ability to step into the future promise based upon your present situation. If you don't quite understand what I'm talking about, have you ever been to a foreign country? Have you ever been to a foreign country? Southerners, have you ever been to New York? New York people, have you ever been to Alabama? <laughs> have you ever been to a place where you're like, what's this food? What's that word mean? Why are you dressed like that? I don't know where I'm going. I need a map. And you feel, you feel a little disoriented. And sometimes you feel like, I don't belong in the, I don't belong in the room. Have you ever been a, in a room that you feel like you didn't belong in that room? I've been there. I've been in pastor's 
gatherings and pastors meetings. I know I shouldn't think this, but this is what the devil does. Devil get in my brain, look around, look at that person. They have a bigger church than you. They can preach better than you. They write books better than you. And all of a sudden, I don't feel worthy of the room that I've been invited into. And I felt like the Lord was saying to somebody today that you don't feel worthy of the room that you're in. And here's the prophetic word of the Lord for you. God is placing you in a room that you don't deserve to be in. You feel overwhelmed. You feel like slipping out. You feel like hiding in the back. But God is saying, I am not only calling you in to the room, but to the front of the room to lead and to lead with influence. I see influence over you. I see influence over you. You're in the room for a purpose and a reason because it's not about you. You didn't get in the room by your own ability and you're not going to lead the room with your own ability. You're going to lead with the influence of heaven. When you speak, you're going to speak with words of wisdom that are beyond your years. When you develop relationships, God's going to give you favor beyond the scope of your natural ability to develop relationships. You have influence. And so go ahead, remember from, from two weeks ago, from three, we, three weeks ago, Ammon and Abraham believed, believed, say believed, and Abram believed and God credited it to him as, there was more syllables in that word than there should have been. God credited, some, God gave it to him as righteousness. He believed, he believed that word Ammon to act as if it were so. Go ahead and act as if it were so. Go ahead and walk like you carry the influence, not in a haughty way, not in an arrogant way, not in a prideful way, but you deserve to be there because Jesus has already paid the price. Some of you, you've, you're feeling this emotionally right now. You've let, you're like, I feel like a foreigner in my business, in my classroom, in my sports team, in whatever. You feel like you're in an arena and this room's too big and you feel like a fake and people are gonna find you out. The world says, fake it till you make it. God says, Amon. Act as if it were so. Act as if it were so. Step into the fullness of your anointing. Step into the fullness of your calling and your influence. Step into the fullness of the word of God that is spoken over you. You are no longer a foreigner. You have been grafted into the family by the blood of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed in the house today. Remember, this started with Abram to Abraham. God wants to change somebody's name in the house right now. He wants to change a name. Your old name was shame. Your new name is confident. Your old name was addicted. Your new name is freedom. Your old name was addition. Your new name is multiplication. Your old name was rebellion. Your new name is obedient. Your old name was sinful. Your new name is forgiven. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, you would say, Pastor, I need a do-over. I've made some mistakes. I've birthed some Ishmaels. I've made all kinds of mistakes, but I need a new name. I need Jesus to forgive me and accept me and love me and put me back on to a fresh start where I can live for him with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? I need that new name, pastor. I need that. I need that. Just slip it up and you can put it right back down. I got you. Who else? Who else in the balcony? Who else watching online today? I need a new name. I need a new name. I'm, be I'm believing. House, can you believe for a new name? Can you believe that noon? See, the Bible, here's what the Bible says in the book of Re Revelation. You say, you're, Pastor, you're just preaching a metaphor. No, I'm not preaching a metaphor. The Bible says that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, a new name is written on your forehead. Your new name, you're going to step into your new name. Go ahead and stand all across the house today. New names being written in the name of Jesus. New names being written in the name of Jesus. If you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you just pray a prayer that says something like this? Jesus, forgive me.
I repent of the old. I repent of my sin. I believe that you died upon the cross. I receive you as Lord and Savior. Help me to live wide awake to the love of God and fully alive to my purpose in Jesus' name. Now I need everybody just to lift a hand and say, God, write that new name. Write that new name. Write forgiven. Write healed. Write it on me, oh God. Come on, somebody. Step in. Step into the room with confidence today cuz i'm safe in you i'm gonna make it through rain came when blue when my house was built on you yes i'm safe with My house is built on you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the service today. If you decided to follow Jesus, we would love to know. All you need to do is text ALIVE to 94000. We have some resources we'd love to give you as you begin your journey of following Him.